modern web applications are built on multiple layers, and each of those layers could present security vulnerabilities. In this video, we'll talk about security misconfiguration exploits. Potential threat actors could be internal or external attackers. Internal might come in the form of someone gaining access to a private network that hosts an intranet web app used by the organization. External attackers, of course, might be able to get in over the internet to take advantage of some kind of remote vulnerability in the web app. We also have to consider that authorized users could also be an entry point for taking advantage of vulnerabilities in an app. So basically, anybody that has network access potentially could threaten our web application. And that's why we can use a layered defense approach, otherwise called defense in depth, to help mitigate. Because we've got a web app that could be built upon many different components and underlying network structures, then our layers of defense need to apply to all of those underlying web app layers. When we talk about security misconfiguration, we're really talking about security settings being configured at some level, but perhaps not correctly. So we could have applications or related underlying systems that are not configured in a secured manner. And we know that our web app has an entire ecosystem that it depends on to allow connectivity that would consist of items like routers, switches, firewall appliances, proxies, and physical and virtual servers. So, for example, if one of these items, let's say a sysadmin, forgets to delete a default account that has elevated privileges, well, an attacker could simply find out what the default credentials are for that account and potentially get in. Now, that might not be directly at the web app level. It could, for instance, be at the underlying operating system level, but in turn, the attacker then could have full control of the host, including the web apps on that host. The OWASP ASVS, or Application Security Verification Standard, is for developers. It provides secure coding guidelines that developers can adhere to through each phase of the Software Development Life Cycle, or SDLC and includes many different things, including how to do proper input validation to prevent things like cross-site scripting attacks. It also provides web app security control testing techniques so that we can test our controls that are in place to make sure that they are effective in mitigating any potential threats. And this would apply not only at the web app level, but at its underlying layers that make it all work. Here in my web browser, I've pulled up the OWASP Web Application Security Project Application Security Verification Standard version 3.0. This is a PDF that is freely available to anybody and it gives developers a great way to essentially have a checklist of components that they should be going through and checking as they're building and testing applications. So for example, if I were to search for authentication, we see we've got a section here on authentication verification requirements. And down below, we've got a checklist of the requirements, things that should be checked such as verifying that all pages and resources in the web app by default need authentication. And of course, that would exclude ones that are to be publicly available. But we want to make sure that we don't allow direct references to web pages, which could bypass authentication or authorization controls. Sometimes a security misconfiguration comes in the form of a developer or a system administrator not configuring something correctly server-side. As an example, let's talk about clickjacking. Clickjacking allows an attacker to embed a valid web page into what's called an iframe on their website. Iframes are used by web developers to embed web pages within other web pages. So the attacker embeds a valid web page a user would visit into an iframe on their website. The attacker then would essentially hide that iframe. They would do that by doing things like setting the opacity to zero. Now, the attacker then would use JavaScript to superimpose either text or buttons, something the user might want to click, over legitimate actions. So, for example, the attacker might create a button that says click to claim prize, which actually covers a different button that, for instance, allows activation of the device camera and microphone. So, we're tricking the user here. Essentially, the user clicks the button thinking that they're claiming a prize when actually they're allowing activation of the device camera and microphone. So where's the security misconfiguration in this example? Well, you could say that it's risky to let JavaScript run on the client-side web browser. However, 
we don't really want to disable that most likely because so many sites use JavaScript for proper functionality. So in other words, what we might want to do is look at something server side. And on the server side, the web server engine, whether it's Apache or Nginx or IIS, it doesn't matter what it is, will configure an option called the XFrame Options HTTP Response Header. And basically what we can do is make sure that content isn't embedded in other sites. This way, essentially, we're protecting from clickjacking attacks. We'll take a look at how that gets configured in a different demo. So because it's such a wide umbrella, security misconfigurations come in many forms. And generally speaking, the overall exploitability is considered to be easy. Because anybody that has network access to a network where that web app is running could potentially attempt to exploit any misconfigurations that they find. The attacker could even exploit IT components used by the web application stack, such as compromising an authentication server. In this video, we discussed security misconfiguration exploits.